to to the right. right. Apple World podcast or something. One of the related things was having Kel Spell yet. Okay, so thanks everybody for coming. Plenty of Mariah, thanks for coming. I apologize. Daddy, <laughs> <laughs> that's a GoPro. That's great. Um, so I appreciate everybody coming down in the middle of uh, summer. I know it's everyone's got stuff going on. I'm going to go real quick and then just give it all over to Adrian to actually go through stuff. Uh, there's the Forge Slack. I encourage everybody to go there to get salty about crypto and uh, have other fun, lightning conversations. It's there. Uh, specifically, there's two different channels for jobs. If you're looking to get a job or looking to hire, there's two great places to do it. Um, if you want to speak at this meetup, you can either go to Slack and hit up myself, Personoid, on Slack or you can go to the women who go paper call is kind of combined and we, we source a lot of our talks through there. We've gotten a couple from there. We just barely got one signed up for November through there. So look forward to that. And uh, we are all the way booked out up to and including November. So we only have one December. spot this December. December's got one. Okay. okay. Yeah, then we're then we're all the way booked up. So it is like a full full catalog of talks coming up every day. December. I apologize. Fine. Um, no, it's great. Go west, speaking of talks. October 21st. 21st. Oops. Close enough. I'm not even going to change it. 21st, put a two in front of there. Imagine there's a two in front of there. Um, you can go get tickets to Go West Comp. Are there still tickets? There's 171 tickets left. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's held, it's held at the local conference up here. Um, and it's online as well, right? It is online, but online tickets are limited. Okay. Ew, that's nice. Um, because it didn't make sense to limit sure. online attendance. It did make sense to limit in person because there are fire marshal laws. <laughs> to to limit who can it anyway. That's great. Um, so we look forward to seeing everybody there. And that's it. I just wanted to rattle through like the housekeeping stuff, and I'm gonna hand it off. I know Mariah has been pestering AJ constantly to come speak for us. I didn't feel like it was I pestering one us. Time. That one time is constantly in my book. No, I think we asked him very nicely, and he agreed to come, and we're really looking forward to it. He's got a lot of great opinions. Looking forward to hearing what he's got to say, so I'll hand it over to you if you want to start taking over, AJ. I'll, um, no, his description. Let me plug in and find out what my screen size changes to and all that. Am I, yeah, because, wait, is this, this is hooked up to the... It's hooked up to me, so you just start sharing through me, and you're good. Okay, to stop. I locally change my screen resolution to not be something insane. Or you just, yeah, whatever you want to do, you just share it through me and we'll start recording. Okay, all right. So give me a second, y'all. I apologize. But uh, I'm also recording. And doing two things recording at the same time as you might imagine is ridiculous. Also, the sun's in my eyes. No. Right? Right? That's only because you're right. tall. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just there we go. Okay. Well, so I don't need to plug this thing in. No. no. This is okay. power if you want, but you don't need it. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Now I've got power. Excellent. All right. So just give me a second here to scale my display. Unfortunately, it does not tell you. Um, okay. Let's make it 60 hertz. Let's make it whatever this resolution is, maybe. Does anybody know on the M1 Max how you get it to show an exact resolution rather than nope. larger, more space? You can run Linux. <laughs> <laughs> on the M1? In general. I mean, can you put Linux on an M1 Max? I don't know. I actually don't know. That's a good question. Anything's possible with Linux. <laughs> I'm sure that somebody has figured out how to do it. Right, well, we'll, we'll see what we can do here. Give me a second. No big deal. Oh, weird. Oh, and I should probably share my screen, huh? Mm -hmm. Whenever you're ready. Yeah, okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right, we got Google Meet. So I'll try to get Google Meet open. Okay, and then I'll change this to, for some reason, Google Meet is not on the right device. Okay, let's do FaceTime. 
Hey, we well, can see me now. Excellent. All right, one step in the right direction. And then there's a present button or something somewhere. There's a share screen, yep. Yeah. A uh, little uh, fox with an upward arrow. Your entire screen, present your entire screen. Okay, so am I presenting now? Yeah, we got you. Okay, great. Okay, um, let's go all the way back here. And then I'm going to go ahead and start streaming. So, make sure everything's connected here. I see audio looks good. All right. Okay. Uh, to avoid infinity mirror. Excellent. All right, so I'm just going to try it this way. And let me just double check. Okay, that looks good enough. We're going to go with it. Okay, so um, I think everything is working. You all see me here. I'm recording. Everything's good. All right, well, um, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. This is uh, Hello Go, subtitled Hello World's Greatest Hits. And I'll get some more about that in just a second. But there are useful links here. So if you go to beyondcodebootcamp.github.io, um, you would find, actually that link just went directly here, but you would find there's a link called presentations and then there's a link, oh, the link's not there yet, but it will be very soon. So there's the Hello Go presentation uh, right there. So if you'd like to follow along, it's uh, beyond code bootcamp.github.io slash prezos slash hello hyphen go. The actual link will be there probably by the time it's watching this recording. Um, and yeah, the video URL will go here as well. And there's a template repo that I created for this that I will update with any errata that we encountered during this presentation. Um, I'm AJ O'Neill. Uh, if you want my, my safe tweets, it's at underscore beyond code. And if you want my unsafe videos, it's youtube.com slash coolage86. Uh, I'm a dangerous wrong thinker, an equal opportunity offender, as pretty much everybody in the room is already aware, and a techno technophobic technologist, which basically means that I think most technology is evil is going to lead to our, going to lead to our doom. Uh, Go is not one of those things, basically. Um, I run Utah Node.js, Utah Rust, and that's why I don't attend the Go meetups as much because I got my hands kind of full. And then I, I live stream on Twitch TV, Cool Age 86. But I love Go. This is the irony is that I love Go. I love Go in a way that Go is part of my soul that I found. Uh, it already existed and, and then I discovered it and it was amazing. I love Go. And, uh, oh, and last thing uh, as part of introductory stuff, if uh, at any time you, you find this as useful or entertaining, con entertaining, consider like, sub, follow, etc. Okay, so Hello World's greatest hits. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this is going to be a Hello World style survey of the world of Go tooling because the language of Go is very, very small as a language should be. And the standard library of Go is all you need in most cases, as it should be. And then there's the extended standard library and there's the tooling. And we're going to take a survey of some of that. Uh, so basically all the little things from Funk.printline to Go Releaser. And if you don't know about Go Releaser, does anybody know about Go Releaser already? Yes, this is good. So if you want to make things available to the world, if you're going to publish something, Go Releaser is the way to do it. So. Uh, this is going to be a whirlwind getting up to that. Okay, so we're going to cover all these types of things and more, not in this order because I didn't go back and, um, and update this. Um, okay, so the zeroth part of this that we need to start with is why go? And most of you in this room have some inkling of why go because you're here. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to share my story, and it's a very simple story, predictable reproducible, guaranteed. This is why Go. Go is the software engineer's dream because it gives you predictable outcomes that are reproducible across computers and teams, and, it, and it's guaranteed. If it doesn't do that, that's a bug. That's not, a, oh, well, we're not implementing that for Windows. That's a bug, okay? 
that is one of the things that I, I love about Go. And like I said, it's smallest. So, uh, and, and it's cross-platform. Uh, kind of wrapped up on that. So, uh, hello, Go. Uh, we need to get Go installed. And so if you go to install Go, there is one tiny little detail that's very unfortunate, is that most likely uh, you're on a Mac or on Linux as a developer. Windows, <laughs> and your install options that are presented as the featured downloads are all bad options. Um, and the reason for this is problems with Mac OS PKG and problems with Linux ecosystem. Um, and so you end up getting something that is going to be a lot better than what you would get from, say, apt, but is going to come into conflict with other system stuff. Fortunately, uh, Go has this nice automatable JSON for its list of downloads. So you can actually get the tarball uh, in a scripted fashion and then update your path and be on to the races. I'm not going to go into that in great detail, uh, but just to high level overview, PKG screws up your permissions on your user local directory. And then if you install, say, Go and Node, then they fight over the permissions, especially when NPM is involved or if you've got some other thing that you've installed via PKG. They, they start fighting at the, the uh, operating system layer for, for permission grabs. And then Brew, if you've used Brew, well, one, Brew is not available on Linux or Windows. And two, if you've used it for any length of time, you've probably had the libssl problem where weird things like curl or SSH stop working because brew puts things in system paths and whatnot. Um, so if you wanted to just do this in the conflict freeway, all you need to do is untar the tarball to local opt, uh, simlink, libs and bins, and then update your path and, and you're good. And I created a tool that uses the JSON that we just looked at, grabs it, and then does exactly that. It's called Webby. So if you're interested in installing Go this way, which uh, it also you get the benefit of being able to switch between Go versions like that in a conflict-free way. Um, so that's just a, a little thing, not really related to the core um, Go tooling. And then somehow this got here in the wrong, the wrong place. So we'll, we'll skip over that. But if you want to run a Go thing, you can just go run whatever.go and you can treat it just like a scripting language. And, and that's really fun. So here's the first fun thing to know about Go is you can just treat it as a scripting language. You don't need, you don't need a directory. You don't need, you don't need anything. You can just run Go as, as scripts and that's, that's pretty awesome. So it makes a nice replacement for Python if you want that uh, you know, predictable, reproducible guarantee. Um, so the next thing that we have aside from Go itself, which there's also some other things that we're, Slides are out of order and I'll, I'll, we'll find them uh, shortly enough, I'm sure. Um, so I talked about the extended library. So Go has a lot of uh, great tools and extended library features. And they're found at golang.org slash X for extended or perhaps for experimental. I'm not really sure. I guess it's, it's experimental. Yeah, but I like to call it extended because it's not very experimental. It's not like experimental in other ways. You've heard the context experimental. Um, especially the tools are extremely stable. So, uh, yeah, but they don't, they don't fall. These are things that do not fall under the mainline Go 1.x compatibility guarantee. They can have their own versions and change, but a lot of these things do get brought into the standard library eventually. Anyway, enough about that. So you basically have three types of things. You've got automatic tooling, stuff that you probably installed without even realizing you installed it just because it's going to be including with, included with any sort of IDE setup, whether you're using Vim or VS Code or whatever it is. You're going to get Go, please, your PLS, the language server, um, Go imports, which formats your imports. And then a Go doc, whether or not you use it locally on your computer, anytime you publish a Go package, uh, it automatically gets parsed into GoDoc. Um, and then you've got, so that's all the stuff that's just automatic. It's happening in the background. You may or may not even know that you have it. Then you've got your dev utils, things that you would be using on purpose, quite possibly with something like Go Generate. So things like Stringer, is that, has anybody used Stringer? So if you create enums in Go, <coughs> they're, uh, they're kind of C style enums, but you can get them to behave a little bit nicer with Stringer. I won't go into what Stringer is actually, but it's it's one of the most common tools that developers use in the the uh, the tools 
library that they use on purpose. Then GoDoc, if you want to actually build the documentation and publish it yourself, not just automatically what gets published to the Go documentation website, but say you had uh, some private packages, you would run the GoDoc tool yourself to be, be able to create that uh, HTML directory. And then embed is something that used to be done via Go generate style, but now is done um, automatically. So I put a little asterisk by that, but we'll talk about that later because that's one of the great things about Go is um, well, we'll, we'll talk about it when we talk about it. And then the third thing that you have out of this is your special purpose libraries. If you just look through your dependencies, I would say these three things you'll probably find quite frequently because uh, all of the cryptographic libraries that haven't necessarily been around for the last 30 years or that aren't NIST approved, they, they kind of end up in X crypto. There's a lot of networking stuff that, uh, especially with the way Google works building HTTP2, then HTTP3 and, and all the different things they're doing, a lot of those tools um, are under that package. And then Sys Windows, because on Windows, you have to deal with things like the registry. So a lot of a lot of tools that um, need to store config files were on, on Mac or Linux, they would store it in the config directory. On Windows, they might store it in the registry. And so it, it needs that. So again, I'm not going to go into depth on any of these. Just you'll, you'll probably see these, and that's kind of what they represent. OK, so um, it, this should have been titled Hello IDE. Um, so whether you're using Vim or VS Code, there's just a bunch of tools like the ones that I mentioned that you're going to want to get and install. And um, there is, I, I did make a simple little installer every time I set up a new machine, which is all the time because I use DigitalOcean and I like to develop in the environment where things are going to be deployed rather than developing on local host and then finding out, oh crap, there's all these problems with cores and security policies and all this stuff that doesn't work when I actually get it on a server. Um, and so, Every time I spin up a VPS, I just run this command, and that's why I use Vim so that I can be on VPSs and it installs um, those tools. And then with Vim Go specifically, you know, it's it's and VS Code is just going to ask you, do you want to install the Go tools? And it's going to be the right stuff. Uh, but once you get that, then you open up a new file that's a .go file, and it's pre-populated for you. And whenever you save, the imports automatically adjust. And uh, if you've got the you know, as long as as long as the the normal stack is there, you just get all of this benefit from the tooling, giving you hinting and auto completes and and so on and so forth. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit, you know, you install Go and you know, something else, and somehow we got to number four. Uh, you know, you get your ID set up. So uh, this is what the anatomy of a Go package typically should look like. It should probably have most of these components, depending on what it is. If it's an application, you should have most of these. So you're going to have your package. Let's call that hello. It's going to have a dot get. That's pretty self-explanatory. Dot ignore, which we'll talk about later. Uh, go dot mod and go dot lock. We'll talk about, we'll talk about all these things later. I'm just presenting them. Um, you're going to have maybe a library file that has some stuff that you expose publicly, as well as uh, maybe any assets that you need to bundle if you've got a web server or if you've got a command line tool that can initialize a config directory or something like that. Um, you've got maybe multiple commands. I think that um, it's it's a real pity, we'll talk about one specifically later, a real pity that more tools in the Go environment don't take advantage of the fact that you can have an unlimited number of commands. Um, it, so if you have very specific configurations, you don't need to have one command that does everything that kind of goes against the Go philosophy. Um, so you can have lots of commands under your, and this is, uh, this uh, most of this is common convention. Uh, I, I don't know that it's necessarily in the Go book uh, that you must do it this way. Some of these you must, internal, um, that must be there. Migrations would be common convention. Tools is common convention. We'll go through all this stuff in a minute. But this is kind of if you just had an empty project that was a, a complete hello world, it would probably have all of these these uh, files and folders in there. And then vendor for your uh, dependencies. So let's talk about um, the well, yeah, the module thing that I was I was just mentioning. So when you oh, I don't know why that says S on there. That's supposed to just be one. So you do go mod init. And then you give it a, a git-ish, URL-ish thing. 
and this is what your module is structured after. So this is the, this is the name of your module and your specific package is whatever the last thing is. So foo. Does anybody uh, need more? Uh, by the way, feel free to cut in at any point with questions. Um, if I'm, I'm going too far or too over the head or anything, uh, stop me because I, I don't I don't really know. So feel free to ask questions. But are people familiar with GoMod in it? Okay, almost everybody. So that cool. So that I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, and then you you would need to run GoMod tidy for it to populate your dependencies because typically you're writing a little bit of code, you're prototyping something maybe, and then you go and run GoMod tidy and it'll populate your your Go.mod to have the correct versions of the things that you're actually using. Okay, uh, so yeah, so we create a project, it's just a directory, we do go mod init, and then we're going to see that it created the, the go.mod file. Um, like I said, it's URL ish, get ish, we understand that. Uh, okay, so now this is where the S was supposed to be here. Hello modules, plural, this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, it, you can have multiple git modules, even in this, I mean, multiple go modules, even in the same git module or sub module, and this can help limit, limit dependency help. Go tries to do this for you. It tries to be really, really good about being lean, but there are some times that um, because of the way that you've structured your project, maybe because of you have a non-standard way of doing tests, maybe you have a test directory for integration tests or an examples directory. There's just, I'm not exactly clear how, how it happens, but you'll, you'll get mountains of dependencies in your go.mod that actually have nothing to do with what you want to export to people. And then sometimes those start to trickle down into the modules folders and then primary offender, uh, golang migrate, you end up with you know, two, 300 megabytes of dependencies for something that's reading text files and uh, doing an insert into a database. Uh, so you can actually, you can do go.mod init, init at different levels of your package, and that will scope the dependencies to that level of the package if you find that you're in the situation where you're getting superfluous numbers of dependencies when people uh, use your package. Um, and yeah, so it just the primary offender of this that makes me so sad, whoops, let me just click on the go.mod. It was, like I said, go migrate. So there's all this stuff, cockroach DB, spanner, WinIO, <laughs> Uh, PGCon, uh, GitLab, Mongo. Obviously, if you're running a SQL migration tool, you're going to be using one or two technologies. You're going to be using a storage engine technology, probably the file system nine times out of ten, which is probably going to be Go Embed. And then you're going to be using some sort of database technology, probably Postgres or SQLite. And as this project grew, it broke from the Go philosophy and started doing everything for everyone. And so now when you vendor this, you end up with, like I said, hundreds of megabytes. So uh, just something to be aware of so that you don't you know, uh, create that. Record. Okay. So the next thing is Go has a philosophy. It has creeds. It has a belief. It has values. And a lot of these are encapsulated in this book that is available on the website. Very short book. It's a booklet. Um, I don't think that it's available in printed form, but it's called Effective Go, and it explains how to name things, how to do package architecture, especially if you're coming from um, a terrible language like the worst of all, C++, or maybe not quite as bad, but factory, 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 Java. You want to read this book because it will help you to not smash your head with a hammer because you'll learn how to do things in a Go-ish way so that you are not fighting against go thinking why can't i create factory factories or why can't i do seventh level inheritance polymutex um, it's because go wants you to not have to deal with those things and it provides simpler alternatives and they're explained uh, here anybody have a comment on that anybody dealt with that coming into go yeah i've dealt with it all right we have a lot of java former Java developers that have started at Weave that are now all, you know, we're all Go, and it's a lot of unlearning of, like, you don't, don't bother, don't bother, don't bother, like, it's, but, it's always simpler than you think it is. I, yeah, I equate it like the transition from Windows to Mac. Everybody hates transitioning from Windows to Mac until they get about two months in and they realize, it, my problem was that I was looking for a settings menu with seven levels deep of something to configure. 
when it was it literally all I had to do was use two fingers on the trackpad or something like that. Um, and then there's the Go Proverbs. I've created a poster for the Go Proverbs so that you can print it and frame it. I literally have this printed and framed. Um, and then use it in code reviews and cite G1, G17, whatever, when you're looking at, okay, is this Go-ish code? And the, so Rob Pike gave the talk. The talk is excellent to listen to. There's the website and then there's the poster, which the website is just kind of like the poster, but less printable. Um, and yeah, so just all of these good ideas that if you don't understand these ideas, definitely a watch the talk, but just kind of like let them seep in because you, the biggest part of go is the belief system and the philosophy, the simplicity, the elegance, the letting go of things that are complicated, the making in the face of ambiguity, refusing the temptation to guess and just waiting it out, let and see. Um, and to that end, I have a, a bunch of, uh, about half of these are Go resources about software engineering. Some of them are from people from other languages, uh, including, I think I have one from a C++ guy on there, uh, Titus Winters, who inspired uh, parts of Go. Uh, but if you, wanna, if you wanna check out some more software engineering philosophy, generally creedsofcraftsmanship.com is a, uh, that's where I keep my curated list that I update on a weekly to monthly basis. Anyway, so next, uh, let's talk about the internal folder. Oh, first, any questions on that segment there? Philosophy of Go. Okay. So uh, next, I just want to talk about the internal folder because this is basically where you should start your code. Your first bit of hello code should probably go in internal because internal is where stuff goes when you're not ready to commit to V1.0. If you can't say, I know this is right, I know this is what we should be exporting out to the world, then pretty much it, it goes in internal. Uh, and so not exported, it, it, it works for non-exported peer packages, meaning anything within your package can access anything in internal, but nothing that uses your package can. So it's kind of like private, but it's not private because the lowercase private and go means that something even within your own package can't access it. Uh, and uppercase means that something outside of your package can access it, but the internal folder is reserved for uh, that, that use case of being able to prototype and experiment with your code without having to commit to a definite um, exported interface. So it works on, it's for whole packages, not for files. It's for things that are experimental or unstable and uh, that have internal implementation details that just shouldn't be exposed or like I said, things that are kind of private. So next we have the tools directory. And this is a common convention. This is not canonicalized, but uh, has anybody ever had the problem where you depend on something like Go Migrate or Stringer or some other tool that's out in the community and you go and run code that has been building just fine, but when you run Go Generate, it breaks. Anybody have that experience? Maybe because the Go community is a lot more mature after 10 or 15 years. But uh, what what the tools package allows you to do is it doesn't it doesn't get built, but it gets tracked so that if you are using somebody else's code or tool, typically things that are used with Go Generate you can put them in here and they will be they will be locked to that specific version so you will never have the problem of going to run some sort of tooling tool and have it break on you and not build and since nobody's encountered that problem in the room i won't spend too much more time on that um, oh and that's the end of it anyway. i feel like that went away with the uh, mod lock or mod some like Modsum is like a Tomol in Rust or whatever. It locks it to a specific version for everything that you have, right? Yes, but this will do this for your tool dependencies. Because oh, your tool like your dependencies command, are like... never imported in code. I see. I see. Okay. This I'm sorry, I wasn't. I didn't communicate that well. But this is for tool dependencies. Like, for example, if you wanted to lock the version of Stringer that you're using, you would do this, and the underscore says despite the fact that this is a binary package ignore the fact that it's a binary package i'm importing it but i'm not importing it and then the go build tools i think this is actually now is that plus 
build. No, they changed it to this. This is the new way of doing it, right? Okay. So this tells it only use this when the tools flag is enabled. So since you're never going to turn on a tools flag, this will never get built. But because it is a flag that could be turned on, it will get included in the go.mod or the, the yeah, the go.mod and the, the go.sum. And because you're telling it to ignore the fact that it's a binary and because it never actually gets included, it tags the version of the thing without actually giving you the error that, hey, this is a binary. So it's it's just a, it's a tooling tip and trick kind of thing. It's like a dev version of scripting stuff or whatever, like dev tools as opposed to like things that people will use with your package. Yeah, so you use it for you when you build and deploy. Other people don't use this. Okay. Okay. So anyway, probably spent too much time on that because this is less, maybe something you're less likely to come. I've run into it. That's why I included. Um, so the other one is the vendor directory. So the vendor directory, we have this because it makes our builds predictable and reproducible and guaranteed. And so that's like why I like having the vendor directory. Now, Go already has a lot of tooling. Every time you run a Go install or every time you run a Go mod tidy, Go actually hits its proxy for Git packages. And then it stores the SHA sum of whatever Git version of the thing that you're installing so that it guarantees that if you were, if somebody were to just commit info side and delete their stuff off of GitHub, this doesn't protect you, the, the, the vendoring protects you against that. Um, but the what what the Go proxy does doesn't protect you against that. It protects you against cases where somebody does a supply chain attack where they publish over a previously published tag. Yeah. So say there's one point one was already published and it knows a lot of people depend on 1.1. They gain access to the repository. They force push over 1.1 with bad, vulnerable uh, malware. <coughs> the Go proxy protects against that. But uh, the, the having the vendor folder protects you against that as well as uh, info side where people just delete their GitHub. And the way that you do this is very simple. You just do Go mod tidy and Go, go mod vendor. And then there you are. Now, depending on the version of Go, the way that I've always had to do this, which I think has been entirely obviated at this point, you used to always have to do uh, dash mod equals vendor whenever you did your Go generate or your Go build or your Go font or any of that. I think that nowadays, as long as your vendor folder exists with a modules.txt inside, I think that it knows to do that automatically. Anybody correct me on that? Okay. So yeah, so mod.vendor, you may or may not actually need to do that anymore. Um, oh, and then there's the, the dot get ignore. I mentioned this earlier. So one of the things that really sucks about vendoring is if you're using rip grep or other search tools to find files, they'll go into the vendor directory and they'll find lots of matches for things like net or create or whatever. If you use the dot ignore file, and this is just common across coding tools, uh, and you put in your vendor folder in your ignore file, then tools that respect the ignore file will respect the ignore file and they won't do their searches down there. So a lot of times you, you don't want to put vendor in your git ignore because then it wouldn't be committed and then you wouldn't have actually vendored anything. Uh, but you do want to put it in your dot ignore so that it's not ignored by git but it is ignored by other tools that would do um, the searching and stuff. Primarily, uh, I, I do this for the benefit of rip grep. Um, does anybody use grep in here? You're living below your privileges. <laughs> and I mean that in the most sincere way. Rip grep is, once, once you use it once, you'll immediately understand the benefit of it. It requires almost no explanation. I use it. Rip grep? Yeah, and the BIM plugin. Oh, they're amazing. Wait yeah. and Silver Surfer. I don't even I don't even use the plugin for it. I just use it from the command line. Plugins, nice, but it's the same. It's the same thing. They're great. Yeah. It's just a lot faster, and it does all the things that you expect to do to do, and it it respects dot ignore. Uh, so let's talk about go generate for a second. Um, so this is what a go generate looks like, and I use the uh, stringer again um, because it makes sense to use stringer because we've already been talking about stringer. But basically, you can create a generate.go where all of the 
the code that you need to produce, if it's you need to be reading in SQL files and generating your structs out of those, if it's uh, if you're using an older tool like Gobin Data or VFS Gen or anything that is doing those processes that are generating code for you, then, then you know use Go Generate and it just becomes the first line of a file and you can basically just have an empty file at a top level of a directory where things are supposed to happen. And then uh, the way that I do it is I use go run. So rather than just running Stringer, which would require that anybody using, so if somebody was just going to go to GitHub and get clone my project, if they didn't know that they needed to install Stringer, they wouldn't have Stringer installed. So then I'd have to add into the readme. Make sure you installed Stringer, which means that that means that they have to have their go bin path set up correctly, and maybe they don't. And you know, so that introduces all of this fallibility. Whereas if you use go run inside of your go generate and give it the exact uh, path and you've got it vendored, then you can guarantee that for other people who aren't you, who aren't on your computer, all they have to do is clone the repo, run the normal go commands, and everything just magically works. They don't have to know how you set up your development environment. So that's the thing there. Oh, and uh, this just pains me. Uh, I, I see people use make files in the Go community, and it just it makes me it makes me physically ill um, because uh, make files are not cross cross platform. They don't work on Windows, uh, and they require you to have typically the whole GCC toolchain. I mean, good luck installing just the make stuff and having it work the way that the author expects. So huge dependencies, and this is what Go Generate does. So. Anytime you, you hear someone say make, that just that shouldn't smell right. You should think go generate. Unless you're in C or C++. That's fine. Well, yes, because you wouldn't be using Go. Yeah. <laughs> You're saying anywhere you see a make. But we've got, we've got a solution for that a little later on, too, perhaps. Yeah, not using C and C++. Yeah. No, even a different solution. All right. A different solution. Um, so then we've got the command directory. I kind of already talked about this, so I'll just kind of skim over it. Um, but you can have as many commands as you want. You can have multiple files in your, um, in your different command subdirectories. So in your hello directory, if hello is the binary that you're building, you can call it main.go. You can call it hello.go. You can have you know, whatever you want. Yeah, I'm, am I right? I'm thinking every one of those folders, when you run go install against a package, those all get installed in go bin. Right, there, there's a there's standard fetch. So if it's a folder under specifically under CMD, and you do go install, you know, my package .github or whatever, those all get stuck into the Go bin. That might be something newer that I'm not familiar with. The way the way that I'm accustomed to doing it is that you would specify the full path. So I would do go install github.com slash example slash hello slash command slash hello. Oh, maybe you're right. I thought that that's what I'm familiar with. Okay, that could be wrong. Though. No, slash hello slash dot dot dot. And I think I think Go will enumerate sub packages. Oh, uh, okay. So if you do them that way. Okay. Because I've seen people do. You're right. I've seen people do cmd dot dot dot. Yeah. To okay. For explicitness' sake, I would prefer to list them out unless there's a hundred of them. And if there's a hundred of them, I have to ask myself other questions. Sure. Um, What's my goal? Hundred. So Go migrate should be split out into about 100 binaries, and that would be a good thing, and you'd only need to install one of them. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, not much more needs to be said about that. So this is what your main file looks like. So now we're actually at the point of this is your hello world code. Well, we showed some earlier with the, uh, the Vim Go example. But you know, so this is what the, your main.go might look like um, in any of those. And then again, this is uh, how you can build it. So you just use go build, and then you give it the output name of the binary that you want, and then you give it the directory name that has the go files that will build that binary. All right, so now let's talk about GoDoc, because we're at the point where we prototype something and we got it kind of working, and now we need to document it. Um, and uh, so there is a doc.go that you can put big, huge blobs of text into. So typically, GoDoc is just, you kind of comment things more or less the way you naturally would if you have 
your ID just, you know, you've just clicked accept on install the go tools, you'll get these complaints that say, hey, you don't have a comment for this thing that was exported. And if you put the comment in the wrong format, it'll say this comments in the wrong format. Um, but the dot dot go to, to describe your whole package can be really um, robust. And there's go doc tricks is I, I will I will point you that direction to learn specifically about how you can do the code blocks and have runnable go playground examples and all that stuff. But I just want you to know that such a thing exists. And if you want to if you want to have great documentation like the go documentation or basically anywhere that you see go doc tricks, that's that's the link to check out. Um, and also, I forgot to put this in there. But anytime what is it? Uh, Dev dot go dot no dot package dot go dot dev is that what it is? So you just put any go package URL after pkg dot go dot dev, and if it's the first time you ever visit that package, it might take it 15, 20 minutes to get it into the queue to generate its documentation. But as long as it's ever been visited before and it has a a git tag version and a license file. This is something I didn't show at the beginning, but Go packages require a license file or the documentation will not build. Because if you do not specify what copyright it is able to share the documentation, it assumes that the documentation is under a restrictive copyright and it won't build and you'll get an error message. So I forgot to mention that earlier. But anyway, um, yeah, you can just throw basically any Go package after this and you'll get wonderfully beautiful documentation. So for example, Go doc tricks. Uh, now this one really only has a doc dot go, um, but you know, and every everybody's familiar with this site, right? Okay, so just uh, I'll skip beyond there. Uh, okay, so let's continue on. So uh, versioning is really important because again, predictable, reproducible, guaranteed, right? Um, this is a little snippet that I like to use when I show how to out when I, when I want to let people see the version of a thing. And basically, there's three different ways, well, four different ways that people might intuitively think that they can see the version of something. BSD style, original Unix style is dash capital V. Uh, the Go style is typically just to use the word version, but also is a single dash in the word version. And then typical, uh, Linux GNU style is to do dash dash version. So if you use a little snippet like this, I'm saying if the first argument is either dash capital V or its version after I trim any leading dashes, then go print out the version. That's only going to trim one dash. Uh, prefix. Strip prefix? Yeah, trim is the one that. I'll update there's it later. I'll make it. There's one that does exact, and then one that does uh, character set. Now something, something errata. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll be. I'll I'll fix it and put it in the errata because I had this in another place. I just I I what trim button. have it available to copy. No, um, and then, well, how do we get what the version should be? Well, you just run git tag because you run git tag tag git stores the version, and then when you go to build, you'll actually be getting the version in your build. A couple of caveats. There's there's two ways to do this. Uh, pretty much at this point, the number one way to do it would be to use Go Releaser, and Go Releaser will. Well, I'll show you in just a second what it does. Um, and the other would be Go Gitver, which is compatible with Go Releaser. So you can basically use either of these. Uh, Go Gitver runs with a Go Generate step. Go Releaser runs as its own publish step. But it will in, it will run the Git tag command, and then it they will embed into your program the version. And the way that they do that, oh, oh no, we're gonna come back around to that because this slide got pasted in the wrong place, so it's gonna be somewhere randomly. But basically, uh, you, you just define lowercase variables, commit, date, and version in your main.go, and those will be overwritten. So you can have uh, version equals v0.0.0, date equals 000-00-00. You know, and so on, and those will get replaced when either you do the go generate or you do the go releaser, depending on which one that you use. Uh, okay, so 
Next thing is hello embed. So embed is when you want to have, like I mentioned this before, when you want to have a program that can do some sort of initialization sequence. So you want to say, okay, I'm going to take the example config file and I'm going to make your dot config slash my program slash config dot JSON or whatever. You want to be able to just take something that you've copied as an example template that's part of the repository and readme, whatever, um, and you want to be able to just fill that in. Or if you want to be able to serve uh, some sort of UI from your application, or you have a desktop application that has lots of assets, images, etc. This is where you use Go Embed, because rather than trying to figure out how do I uh, distribute my Go program so that it's got this directory structure and it's got a self-extracting installer, and you, know, you just don't you don't have to deal with any of that. Uh, you just include all of your assets in the binary itself, and this supersedes the old things like Go Bin Data and VFS Gen, and it's a little bit more efficient because it doesn't uh, require the use of unsafe Go to be efficient because it's in the standard library and things in the standard library are allowed to use unsafe Go uh, and be more efficient. So uh, basically it just looks like this. It's incredibly simple. You just do go embed and then you give it a list of files and or folders and or patterns to match. So I could do HTML slash star.html HTML slash star.js, HTML slash star.css, whatever, yeah, assets. And then the file system gets the same way that you see it here is the same way that you access it. So you have a virtual file system that works exactly the same way that the file system in Go has always worked. And uh, when you want to open something inside of this folder, you do fs.open and then you give it HTML slash whatever the file name is, and then it opens the file for you. Uh, so, does anybody use Go Embed? Yes. The standard libraries now full of methods and like the HTTP file server takes uh, FS and yeah. FS dot walk will walk through those. Like there's a lot of places you can pass that. Yep. 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 I'm, I was so glad to see it. I was, I was just absolutely stoked when they, because it, I mean, it makes sense. It, need, it needed to be in the standard library. And, and I'm glad that they implemented the, the way that they did. You know, if you remember VFS Gen, so many options, so many different ways. You know, and, and their and their thing is, look, if you want to strip the prefix, then just put the file in that directory, and and that's how you strip the prefix. Get rid of the prefix by putting the generated file or the embed file in the directory. So anyway, this would be embed.go. I didn't title this. I should title this. This would be embed.go. That's what that would look like. A lot of these tooling files. Uh, I think the general convention and what I do is tooling files just get their own name. It's generate.go, build.go, embed.go, so on and so forth. I don't put any code in the, uh, the tool files. And then this is how you use it. So you use it exactly the same way that you would use uh, the file system module, except that it is, um, I, I, I have it in some package and I access it by virtue of whatever name I gave it. And you can give it any name. You know, the, the part right here, so whatever this comment is that comes directly above the next line that has embed.fs, whatever this comment is, that's what this file system becomes. Uh, the, so you can call this foo, you can call it bar, you can call it whatever, and you can have 10 of them. You can have do strings and byte slices as variables that you embed single files directly into. Yeah. Thank you for that note. Okay. Um, oh, and then in my example project, I, I, I have a little proverbs command that it just reads in the Go proverbs and prints them out to the screen. So everybody should go install that. Okay. Um, and then we're finally on to maybe one of the last pieces here, I think, which is um, Go Releaser. So Go Releaser's got a lot of options. Uh, it's got really great documentation, but the documentation has not necessarily got the nice TLDR that's, here's what you need for 90% of use cases, and here's what you need for 90% of the other 10. And so I put a cheat sheet together on webinstall.dev. Uh, Go Releaser is installable via webinstall.dev. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all this stuff here, but whether you need a single binary, you need multiple binaries, you need cross compilation, all those basic combinations are described in this cheat sheet. So you can just take a look. 
Um, but to give you, uh, well, first of all, you know, let's repeat the mantra, predictable, reproducible, uh, guaranteed. That probably should have come first. Why go release? Um, so it will, it'll, it'll, like I said before, it'll grab the version, the git commit, and the date, and inject it into your program. Oh, here we go. Here's the slide that I meant to duplicate earlier. So this is what this is what that looks like. Go releaser will inject this. Uh, you can give it a config file. This is a very, very simple one for a single binary that I've even called a little bit so it'll fit on a single slide. So you can make sure that CGO isn't enabled so that you've got predictable, reproducible, guaranteed builds. Um, you can define the binary name, say which operating systems and architectures you want it to cross compile for, and then even do overrides so that, for example, uh, Windows get a zip file instead of a tar file. Although, Windows comes with tar.exe, uh, the BSD version that isn't encumbered by the copyleft, uh, which also, interestingly enough, will unzip zip files. Uh, but I would recommend for Windows, you probably want to use zip because the UI on Windows works better with zip. And I don't know if the UI works with tar files, even though the command line does. Um, so anyway, this is this is what a really, really basic one would look like. And then the most important piece is that, uh, of course, if you're going to release something, you want to release it somewhere, you probably want to release it alongside the code on GitHub. And to do that, all you need to do is go into your settings, create a token that is a release token, and then store it in config go releaser GitHub token. So then when you run uh, go releaser, I should have actually put the full command, but I'll go back to this cheat sheet real quick, because um, I think it's right up top here. You would run go releaser init, you'd modify your go releaser.yaml, and then you'd run um, go releaser, uh, and you wouldn't run snapshot and skip publish because you wouldn't be in dev mode, you would be actually in publish mode. So you would just run go releaser rm dist, and that would build, embed all the things, run go generate, uh, have go embed. All of the tools that we talked about would they'd all be executed by default because that's what go releaser does, it follows the common conventions. And then you would get packages up on GitHub that have the tools that you want to make available to people. So there's that. Um, yep, and then the cheat sheet again right there. And then last thing is uh, once you have a Go Releaser set up, that's really great because then people can go on GitHub and they can download your stuff. But then we're actually we circled all the way back around to the original problem. Whether you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux, once you've, been, once you've downloaded something, you have to place it somewhere in order for it to be runnable. And on Mac, you also have to unset the, uh, what do they call it? Um, when you put someone in confinement, when they have a disease, you call it quarantine. Quarantine. You, on Mac OS, anything that's downloaded that isn't signed has a quarantine bit. And so if you want someone to be able to run the command that you've produced, you have to unset the quarantine bit. And this can be very difficult to explain to somebody who is a Mac user, potentially. Um, so we have this issue of path and we have the issue of the quarantine bit, specifically on Mac. And that is one of the things that Webby can help you with. So if you've already published a Go releaser, everything's already done. You just need something that's going to set the user's path to have your tool in it in the right place and unset the quarantine bit. Um, and so Webby does this in a predictable, reproducible, and guaranteed way cross-platform. Um, and there's a template repo right here. And under the dist webby, there's the three files that you would need to basically just do a find and replace on with the name of your GitHub organization, the name of your GitHub repo, and then do a find and replace on super name of instead of being called hello, whatever it is called that gets installed. Um, and then you could make a, a pull request to webinstall.dev and then you could make your tool installable as easy as is Go Releaser. So basically, this is what you would get with webinstall.dev is you, you create the readme, is what you know, the TLDR, and people get a copy and paste command that's super easy. To, to memorize, or if they've already used Webby, then they can use the Webby command. Um, and it, it doesn't modify system directories like Brew does. It only installs the thing that you actually want to install. It doesn't download a huge Git repository. It doesn't have tons of helper utilities. It does have two small helper utilities. But um, anyway, so that uh, can be a way for you to be able to actually then distribute your application. Oh, and then uh, this was supposed to say, hello, Zig. 
uh, but I, I didn't have time apparently to update that, and I don't have time to talk about. Um, well, I didn't have time to prepare to talk about Zig. You're probably bored out of your mind at this point. So, um, but Zig is a C compiler that can make C Go cross compilation just work. Now, there's some caveats to that because in the situations that I've tried to use it in, the reason that I wanted to use it was that the C code was so incredibly complex that it wasn't possible to get it to compile in a reasonable way. And it had a mix of bash files and make files. And, and at that point, Zig can't necessarily help because Zig isn't a bash interpreter. Zig has limitations on how much of the macro system it implements. It implements kind of the 80-20 where almost any project you come across, it can run its macros, but there are ways that you can have macros within macros. I mean, if you've ever used C code, There'll be a macro that defines a macro that defines a macro that runs a macro that defines a macro and Zig can't handle that perfectly all the time um, because C is non-standard and non-portable and there's only so much you can do. But for a lot of things such as SQLite, uh, Zig can give you faster, simpler, more reproducible builds of C code. Um, so for a lot of things that you'd, you'd want to be using. All right. So uh, that is the presentation. I will open it up for questions. If anybody has any, and one more reminder, uh, like, sub, and follow if you want to, if this was interesting or interesting. Any questions? Yeah, well, uh, that was kind of a whirlwind tour, but I hope that everybody learned nothing. That would, that would be the greatest desire of my heart. <laughs> But in a good way. Sorry to disappoint you, but I did learn a couple things. So <laughs> I have information to kill make files now. So it, is that SIG compiler related to the language? Yeah. No, it is not related to Go at all. It's a completely separate project that is yeah. uh, aimed at creating a, a better way to do really simple. It's kind of a... It, Zig is to C what Rust is to C++. So what, what Go is to C sharp, Rust is to C++, and Zig is to C. I know a lot of people would argue with that, but I agree. <laughs> uh -oh. I mean, I don't think it's that controversial to say. I think that those were actually pretty mild statements. You're at a Go meetup, and you're talking about Rust. And okay. But come on, nobody here wants to use C++. You don't get out of the bed, bed in the morning and think, oh, you know what I want to do? Pound some C++. But the Rust people, they're like, you know what I want to do? Pound some C++. Oh, it sucks. Wait, I've got Rust. Right? Yeah. So for people that want to pound C, Zig is an opportunity to have. I mean, so I mean, Go has a runtime that's quite large, right? I mean, at bare minimum, you're looking at, I, I don't think you get below four megabytes, right? Maybe maybe two if you enable the stripping options of the debugging symbols or something. But Go is really, really big. So if you wanted to implement LS, maybe Go isn't the right language to do it. If you wanted to implement BusyBox, maybe Go is. But if you wanted to implement small, tiny tools and uh, libraries that were going to get included into C-like programs, Zig gives you the ability to do that um, in a very nice way. And I'll bring up zen of zig because zig much like all languages that are good languages go python um it has it is made by zig ziglar yes it has a proverbs let's see um zen of ziglar let's try ziglang <laughs> ziglang i think is a thing yeah we should twitter for it let me just try Ziglang to get to the main website. Because if you go to the main website and you go to the documentation, learn documentation, language reference, down at the bottom, the very, very bottom is the Zen of Zig. And it's very, very simple. It's very Go esque. So anybody that's familiar with the Go Proverbs should find these. Well, I mean, the Go Proverbs is a nod to the Python, uh, the, the, the Zen of Python. It even has the same 19 stanzas. and says some of the things in different words. Zen has not gone all the way to 19, but you can see very similar, uh, let me bump this up a little bit for those 
in the back or the front or wherever you happen to be. Let's maybe get down here to the bottom. Um, yeah, so very, very similar to Zen of Python and, and Go Proverbs in terms of its philosophy. So I don't think of Zig in any way being a competitor to Go. I think it being, you know, and I know there's cases where Go is not the solution. We choose Go because it is predictable, reproducible, and guaranteed. And there are environments that are not that way to begin with, like microcontrollers or you know, other things where you need to shave off the runtime. Okay, to give up a few of the guarantees in order to get some of the other benefits. Totally fine to tell people at the Go Meetup to check out Zig too, because maybe you got that use case. You could not reach for Go for like a MIPS processor, an embedded project. You should probably reach for Rust or, or Zig, depending on your needs. Screw you, pal. <laughs> 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 the leader of the rest of the truth hurts, AJ. The yeah. truth hurts. Okay. Well, no, I, if it's truly embedded, if you're not running an operating system, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I won't I won't gush about Zig because we're at the Go Meetup, and I, if there's any other questions around tooling in Go or uh, any feedback you have, I'd love to hear that. I, I think you summed it up well. The, the important thing for Zig for this meetup is that it it is meant to replace a lot of the tool chaining to make them more predictable in cross-platform and more stripper friendly, stripping the, wow, all right. It's <laughs> okay, stripping, it's stripping just the runtime down. Uh, so it, it replaces all the make files, or replaces all the auto tools, or replaces just so much stuff that you don't actually want in your tool chain especially if you're running it on someone else's machine, like a cloud or another dev or whatever. Yeah, and if you and you, if you have stuff that you want to compile for Windows that is requires C code and you want to be able to mostly use Go, then it's a good tool in the toolbox. Any, anything, anything else? Um, and any, any feedback, because right now I'm on the backup list for Go West. And so I, I need any feedback that you have about what to do better as well. I don't have feedback about what to do better, but I keep thinking about versioning because I've been like tackling that today in a project and uh, that's Go has like this long and frustrating history of putting version information into binaries. That's not frustrating. Well, you're frustrated. I'm frustrated. <laughs> it's a great feature that Go has that you can create a variable and then the tooling can assign it a value at compile time. That's cool. And that's normal. Yeah. Every language does that. Yes. However, it's so nice that with Go 118 now, if you do go build, uh, it will actually put your BCS information right into the binary. Oh, so this that's is new. I don't know about this. Yeah. So I preach. Uh, <laughs> I would no, automatic now? Yeah, automatically. Is it, so, it, does it follow the Go releaser standard where it's commit date and uh, version, or or did they did they screw it up it's, for it's, no reason? So there's like, it you can you can get this from the um, runtime debug package, I think. There's like, get build info, and then the settings field in the return struct has a slice of key value pairs. Don't ask me why it's a slice of key value pairs. But um, I can imagine. I have some ideas. I have some ideas too. But anyways, um, there are several new keys that have been added. Like um, uh, VCS tells you the version control system of Git or whatever else you're using. VCS dot revision tells you the SHA, the commit SHA. Uh, first, where should I look for this? Um, should I just look and go build? Yeah. Or. Yeah. Oh, by the way, if you don't have the Go search extension, you're also living below your privileges as a member of the Go community. So I was looking at the release notes for Go 118, actually. Okay. But I think you can also find what we're looking for in, well, the release notes for Go 118 is probably the best place, or the runtime debug package. But basically, yeah, it tells you the commit SHA, the time, <laughs> the whether there are modifications, so whether basically it's a clean copy of the commit or not. That's really interesting. Yeah, so build, build info. Then struct. So the okay. settings, it's the settings slice. And if you look at each build setting, there's, again, it's a slice of key value pairs. But um, 
they probably didn't want to limit it because there will be new VCSs in the future, et cetera, et cetera. Um, possibly, yeah. So, well, as opposed to like a, a map. But anyways. Uh, what part of that bothers you? You Now that it's doing it for you now and it's no. duplicated or that it's getting it's extra data? What I've always wanted is people to who like run, let's say, Caddy from source and they just do go build or go run and they just deploy that because that's actually really common still. And when they go to file a bug and we have them to cite the output of Caddy version, it gives them devl or unknown. Oh. Because there's no version information included in their build. And these are not the same people who compiled it and deployed it on their system usually. And so they have no idea. And I have no idea. And usually it's fixed or we're looking at different code and it's all in that. So what, what I, I mean, it's, if you've got the solution already with go build and you're already on go 118. As of today, we, we set our minimum version to go 118. So we can do that now. Okay. Go 119 is released. Your version command now scrapes that data as well as the, the injected build time data to give you both. Well, when I'm done with it, by okay. golly. <laughs> <laughs> it, won't, it won't help anybody winning old versions. That can only help you with new things, right? But. Well, yeah. So the other there's other ways to get the version, though, too. So like um, they actually embed your go.mod file in your binaries, too. So you have the versions of all your dependencies, but uh, except for your main package. That one's not, for whatever reason, that version is not embedded in your go binary. So, Right now, if you want to get the version information, like before going 18, you had to pile a caddy or whatever Go program where its main is a dependency. So you have to actually make a new main package and then call the main indirectly, like as a dependency, and then, then you have version information. So this may be completely irrelevant at this point because we now have Go 118. But if you were in a situation where you were trying to protect against that problem and for some reason, that methodology doesn't work, which it probably will because Go is predictable, reproducible, and guaranteed. Um, that's, that is what this package does as well. You just put in a Go generate, yeah, and then it's cool. as part of your Go generate step, it we a version to, on Go. We used to do that before Go modules. We would do this very thing where you just, yeah, you create unexported bars, and then you just replace the values at compile time, basically. And then go modules, they do embed some version information for all your dependencies. And so the trick is to make your main a dependency. And now with go 118, uh, the situation's a little better. So. Well, 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 making your main a dependency okay. by yeah. definition a secret. Like, you say the trick is, it's like kind of half of them. Okay. It's kind of like the tools thing. Yeah. yeah, kind of. Yeah, actually. It's very much like the tools thing. You're leveraging go.mod where it should be expected to. Okay. Anything else? I'll step down. Okay. Well, we're, we'll stop the recording now. Um, you're welcome to stay on. Yeah. You already clicked? Why are we doing another one? It helps you when I edit it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, the All right, we're about to edit. We yeah. will uh, let everyone can stay on. It's going to stop the recording, and we all stay back and say the real salty stuff. <laughs> all right, salty times go. Okay.